Hello, hello, hello. There we go. I don't know what is it what it is with OBS where every time I open it or every time I do use OBS when I had already done something else in terms of broadcasting, OBS is like, no, F your microphone, go away. And so I have to reintroduce it into my uh, overlay setup, which also means that I have to redo the volume, which is why it was loud earlier. Hi, Rudinell. Uh, I'm glad you dig the opening theme. I was going for like energizing, um, obviously broken software, yeah. Uh, a good and true bit, but it's free. So if I, you know, if I was paying, if I had paid $50 once, or if I was paying like $15 a month to use OBS, I would certainly expect different i would my expectations would be different than they are right now is what i will say but it mostly works it's fine we figure it out today we're just hanging out and we're talking about genre knots the rpg so i have a thing that i need to be at uh that i need to get to and be there by four or a little bit before four i'm going to the dentist exciting so i didn't want to try and do a longer stream today uh, and therefore, we're just going to hang out and talk about genre knots for a bit. Yeah, I think I'd love to see a, sis, uh, a system where it's easier for more people to do stuff that they're excited about and not, um, not have to feel like they need to um, charge for it in order to be able to survive. Like, if, if everybody's needs were taken care of by, like, mutual... Uh, mutually assured systems like mutually um interdependent systems and then people had more time to just like do sh do stuff that they really liked uh that would be great but i understand that we live under capitalism and uh, people need to pay rent and pay for food and all that kind of good stuff so i use the free stuff that i can and we make we make do i'm gonna adjust my camera here a little bit i'm gonna go this way and I'm going to go this way. Okay, hello. I'm back. Or I didn't really ever leave. Uh, thank you to Megany e. O'Keefe uh, who for the follow uh, earlier today. Uh, if you are here, uh, thank you specifically. If you, see, if you see or hear later on, thank you then. Uh, Megan is a very accomplished uh, fantasy and science fiction writer. You should definitely check out her books. I got to work on uh, with her on her first trilogy, which is like fantasy, a little bit of steampunk vibe heist with um, strong like Lies of Locke Lamora-ish vibes. You know, that was a, the, a more prominent comp a few years ago when those books were coming out. Probably more years ago than I'd like to think because time is a lie. Um, so that's that. I am going to see if I can make my make this uh chat window or this uh this document show up as an item so let's see window capture no what i want is windward okay great so then we're going to move this around and nope i'm gonna Just let me move it. Yeah, no, no, I don't want that either. Here we go. That's the hotness. Now we're talking. Um, so we're going to move me to move to here and then I'm going to shrink this part nope all right we're gonna go back to this one and then I'm just gonna shrink my camera is what we're gonna do 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 hello here we are that's much easier I'm going to move this. Okay, so you'll get at least some of the text as I'm talking about it. All right, I'm going to scroll a bunch back to the very top of this, so don't worry. 
and we can get rid of that. Oh, except then I messed it up because it recentered. Okay, here we are. So this is Jean Renat's version uh, 098. So we're getting very close to version 0.1, which is the version that I am planning on releasing on itch.io as a work in progress game where people can buy it and check the game out and see what's it, what it's about. And in doing so, I can fund ongoing development. Because if I, if I put this game out myself, I will need to do editing, layout, copy editing, art, uh, and other such things. My hope is to find a good publishing partner because having self-published my own books, I know how much work it is to publish a thing. And I know that I am not as well versed in the uh, like game publishing world as I am in the trade book publishing world. And so I appreciate the importance of experts. I don't know that that is a certainty because I haven't pitched anyone and no one has said yes because no one has had the chance to say yes. So I cannot guarantee what format this game will kind of reach its final form in. But I've done a lot of work on it already. It is a about 140 pages. Uh, Twitch keeps freezing. Interesting. My bitrate is pretty consistent at about 5,200. Yeah, I know some publishers I can approach. My my preference is somebody who ha already has some expertise or at least familiarity in publishing uh, Forged in the Dark role-playing games because that's what this game is. And if they publish some Forged in the Dark games, it is more likely that they are going to be able to uh, you know, get the game in front of other people that already like Forged in the Dark role-playing games. But we'll see. That is farther down in the process than, uh, than we are now. So I'm going to zip, zip down here to recent changes. I think I haven't done one of these in a couple of months, so I'm going to talk just uh, talk about some of the things that I've done recently, and then a big thing that I want to do today is talk about what I want to get done and where I want to be before I hit that version 0.1 and put it on sale, because patrons at my personal Patreon at patreon.com slash Michael R. Underwood, um, I should probably do command bio here, which should have my Patreon. Hey, good job. I remember my commands. Uh, so backers at $3 a month and higher ha always have access to the latest version of the document as I kind of post and keep them updated. But then the version on itch.io will be kind of the, the paid version where anybody who, who buys that will be able to access the kind of ongoing drafts as I'm doing it in that edition. And then uh, I'll kind of keep developing the game. So some of this is in response to feedback from playtesters, because I do have an external playtesting group going right now where I kind of did a big call and got, you know, a dozen plus responses and tried to line people's schedules and had volunteers to run games. Uh, unfortunately, some of my volunteers have not been able to, to follow through on running games because life happens. But I have one person running a game for which I'm very grateful and some folks playing with them. And they gave me some feedback. So one of the things I added recently is, or I've added a, f a decent bit of stuff that is like, here's what it's like in the world of the genre knots. Here's what the genre knots do. Here's their vibe. Here's what daily life is like. And talking about the kind of um, firehouse vibe where they're around and maybe on call, but nothing is super actively happening, but then they have to leap into action. And sometimes there's long hours and that kind of stuff. Per a suggestion from a colleague, I added more specific write-ups of how load works in this game for people that are not familiar with Forge in the Dark games. And I also kind of finally did my the, my work of writing up the kind of standard genre knots gear, where there is specialist gear that is for your playbook, and then there's team gear that each playbook gives, and then there's the regular gear, which everybody has access to. And I had it on the character sheets, but now I've kind of, I've created some text that goes with it for people's reference. And that's to include things like the personal phase manipulator, which is a thing out of the books, 
where people can wear it and then kind of change how they are appearing in the world to be able to fit in in a different way if they need to, which was in in no small way, it was my, uh, it was the trick that I used to not have to make as many of my stories uh, take, uh, basically I didn't want to have to feel like I was writing around racism um, and sexism and transphobia and homophobia, where I wanted it to be easier for the main characters in these books to be able to engage in kind of more the more stereotypical mode of a given genre without having to have that element smacking them in the face. Sometimes because it's just not what I wanted to be writing, like theme or tone wise, and sometimes it's because to do so would be stepping more out of my own personal experience. Um, because you know, if I'm right, like the the first genre that's episode is a western, and so. I try to include in that story, like, oh, you know, the like we have this fact, the the reality that most historical cowboys in that tier in that period were Mexican and or Black Americans, um, but John Wayne is the kind of Hollywood iconic uh, cowboy as a white dude, and so there's a little bit of a little bit of that, but I wanted to constrain the degree to which I was writing stories that were not just starring people from backgrounds that weren't mine, but were about those backgrounds. And so I have the personal phase manipulators. These are also a little bit of a soft safety tool in this game, where if your group decides, okay, we're fine having the kind of traditional oppressive uh, ideas in a genre be in that genre, because we're going to work against them, we're going to challenge them, we're going to oppose them. But maybe one player is a little bit less excited about it but they're still happy for it to be an element and for other folks to engage with but they don't want to have to engage with it their character can use a, 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 a personal phase manipulator and kind of wipe away at least some element of whatever challenge they would be facing due to discrimination that was the intent i'm hoping that it continues to be useful in the game and it doesn't have to just play that role. It does let you do other things like impersonate somebody or something like that. Per a suggestion from um, from a, a mentor, uh, from a mentorship program that I got to pers- participate in, I've changed scars to hangups because I was already intending for the stand-in for what is trauma in Blades in the Dark to be framed more softly and in a less permanent um gritty fashion because my the thing that i'm thinking about is if you're in a tv show and somebody is in a bad situation early in the season and then they have a hang up about that thing over the course of that season which becomes a character subplot that's more what i'm going for so a hang up might be you know, you might have a hang-up that is claustrophobia, but it's not necessarily capital C claustrophobia, and maybe it's going to be expressed in a way that is less either pathologized or less pronounced. Because already in Blades in the Dark, when you take a trauma condition, the book says you can play this up or play this down as much as you want. And it will you will get XP if you play it up to the degree that it creates challenges for you. But you don't have to do it. It's just a tool for framing your role play. The only other mechan- like the mechanical impacts that it has are that you have to indulge your vice if you have one or more trauma. And uh, otherwise you take stress equal to the number of traumas you have. And then if you reach four traumas, you are out of play. You can't continue as a scoundrel. I have maintained the um, if you reach four hangups you kind of have to retire from field work, at least temporarily, I would say. But what I want for hangups is for somebody to be able to either set a long-term project or have it be just a clock on the table over the course of the next few sessions or the rest of the campaign that is that character dealing with that hangup. In the novellas, we, I would say that Roman has a hangup about going home, that he never wants to have to go home because... The, le- the person he had to be in his home world is not a person he wants to have to be anymore. But 
if I was using the original cast as the player characters in a game, there might come a mission where everybody else in the team has gone to the kind of post-apocalypse wasteland and something bad has happened and Roman set, like kind of commits to going back to that world and trying to help the group. And that in, that pro- in that process, we would be addressing kind of this clock of the hangup of, okay, you know, do you take a penalty when the hangup is, when that clock to kind of resolve the hangup is not filled and what actions can you take to do that or does it feel like gradually as you kind of as you spend time away from the thing that you're trying to avoid there's a bunch of different options there and that's really going to be a judgment call for the gms uh, the gm and the player specifically Uh, there's a bit of clarification here i clarified suggested consequences and methods for gathering information the way that i have often played force in the dark games codifies a what I view as a soft rule in Blades in the Dark and other Forge in the Dark games where you have free play and in free play you might gather information in preparation for doing a score. If you gather, if you spend too much time gathering information, the GM is encouraged to start filling clocks as time is passing and maybe the opportunity to pull the score off um, is reduced. What I have done often is codify that into the legwork phase means that in free play before a score everybody can take one action to gather information or prepare for the score i have clarified what i mean in here because i have the recon phase as an official phase in the game where you do intel you deploy you have recon and then you pick your plan and you make the engagement roll and I've also talked a little bit about the the thing in uh, gathering information roles where some te- some of the text will say, if you get a one to three on gather information, you get limited information. Like, oh, okay, well, that makes it sound like it should be a, um, a fortune roll because you're always going to get something and there aren't consequences necessarily. But then sometimes gather information is an action role because there would be consequences because you're in a position where there is a threat or somebody could like see what you're trying to do and push back. So there's a little bit of clarification needed there. I fixed a thing in how the Intel role worked that wasn't operating the way that I wanted to, and that's based on feedback from playtesters, which is great. And another note in playtest was people feeling like the word and the term breach was used broadly and in a way that they found um, vague enough to be confusing, confusing, where breach is a mechanical rating there are breach advances and then there's breaches that are story breaches i used breach in kind of all of those fashions in the fiction and did not get that kind of pushback these are different media and that's fine but looking at that i said okay do I feel so strongly about maintaining this term as the term that has permutations? Or is there a way to still have it mean all the things that I want it to mean, but to clarify it so that it does not have as many mechanical incarnations that can be confusing? And so what I've done is I have taken the breach rating, which is the analog of the wanted rating, where in genre knots there is dimensional instability, which is like heat, sort of. Um, but it's also like the adversary clock in Girl by Moonlight. As you do missions and as you gather ripple in a story region, there is a formula where one half of the ripple you accumulate becomes instability. And instability is a um, an interdimensional clock, or an inter- interdimensional meter. It's the overall dimensional instability of your universe. When instability reaches nine, it becomes, or it used to become breach. You would have one level of breach. Um, But then I had breach as the description of a story break, and I had breach advances, which happen when Ripple fills in a region. Okay, maybe that's enough different things that it becomes a little tricky to follow. What I've then done is I have, almost every time I'm talking about a breach in a story, the text says story breach. And then I have breach advance as a separate term. So these are two game terms. 
I have t then taken the breach as a rating and I've replaced the term breach with um, a breach rating with chaos. And so you have instability leads to chaos. And breaches lead to instability, lead to chaos. And hopefully that streamlines and clarifies and makes it easier to follow all the different things that I'm doing without having to like double check things as much. And part of making this a game is being really clear and specific so that people who are playing without me in the room can still get everything out of it that they're looking for. And people who are playing it without having read the fiction. So that's fine. I like chaos as the analog to instability, like instability leads to chaos, instability leads to breach. Okay, cool, chaos. I changed renown back to reputation because as my mentor said, uh, in like business or office environments, one doesn't often hear about renowned teams, but you might hear about a team with a great reputation. I'll still use the, the kind of uh, the term rep. Rep for genre knots feels like it's going to have a different, some different manifestations than rep in Blaze in the Dark, which is about like your rep as a criminal crew. And where I am departing from Blades, I want it to be because there is a specific good reason to use either the same or a different term. And if using the, if the different term does not fit, I'll either want to come up with a separate different term, or I will go back to the more commonly used and recognizable term from within the Forge in the Dark framework and or from the SRD itself. There are a lot of Forge in the Dark games, many of them, a number of them use rep. And so that is not a, pl a, a place where I think I will get criticized necessarily on a, as a designer for like, oh, well, you're like, you specifically are just copying Blades in the Dark here. A lot of people use that framework. It's fine. If I, if I or an editor or somebody else comes up with something that they like better uh, and then I think makes sense and then maybe I get some feedback and playtesting, sure, maybe we can do that. That's fine. I'm not precious about that. And then the last thing I did recently was just kind of beefing out or like rounding out the text as I take this more toward a thing that can be read without having read or played another Force in the Dark game. So I added a lot of examples of uh, resistance. Resistance examples down here. Okay, so um, uh, let me adjust this because you're not seeing the edge of the page here. Oh, right, because I added the search thing again. Anyway, I'll leave the search thing up so that I don't mess myself up again. So I have one, two, three, four, five, and then six resistance examples. This is so that there are two examples of resistance with each, um, for each of the attributes. So there's two actor resists, there are two crew resists, there are two director resists. And I tried to use different actions in different types of situations. These examples are a little long, but they are very detailed so that you can use these to learn how rolling resist use uh, works. They're not the most unpacked and um, step by step by step by step, but they are fairly co uh, coherent or com um, they're fairly uh, comprehensive. That's the word that I was looking for. Yeah, the in the independent design space, there are a lot of games that draw very heavily on other games, and that is kind of a generally um, a generally accepted way that people do things. You know, you give credit where credit is due, and you add what is specific and what is interesting to you, and you put your own spin on things. Um, so yeah, I agree, Arudnell. The the question of what is rip, like what it is what is it to be ripping something off in an RPG is one that I think a lot of people have talked about, and I'm not as interested in um, having discourse about because I'm more interested with what you do with the rules 
than where those rules came from. Whether you are drawing, you know, you're drawing direct influence by kind of taking a rule or um, a system framework and putting it into a new context, or whether you are just kind of adding something to something that already exists, you know. Where does where does it where does something stop being a hack and start being its own game? I'm not as interested in that, at least in this framework right now, the conversation we're having. Maybe some other time, maybe at a bar con. We can talk about that division where I think it's probably a blurry line. All right. So that's a bunch of stuff that I did. What else do I have? I have, I clarified some other stuff. I don't remember if last time I had already shown off my superhero region right up. So I have uh, the superhero uh, genre region. This was hard to write stuff for because superhero is so broad as a genre and because I love superhero stuff so much. So I had to really think at a 10,000 foot view and think about what type of things do I need to put in this like specialist abilities and other stuff like that for people to engage with the superhero genre in the way that I want to facilitate. And uh, as Arudinal says, it's super hard to do, or it's very hard, it's super hard to do superhero rules because one superhero is a uh, like is a hybrid medium because it's both image and text, right? And the action, much of the action exists in the reader's imagination through the way that they, uh, the reader, imagines the transitions between frame or between pa panels, right? We have panels and we have gutters, and panels are generally a moment. And often when, you know, often you're going to want to have an, a moment of action leading to another moment of action. But the flow and the transition between that is, happens in the reader's imagination, not on the page. You can have, like, a, you can have transitions in, you know, you show, like, a process in panels, but it's not going to be frame by frame in the way that you can do something in film. This is one of many challenges. Also, it's like... You're gonna have an exhaustive li list of superpowers. Like in Dial G, G for Jean or not, I have a list of powers: toughness, strength, flying, super senses, speed, energy blasts, elemental control, telepathy. That is not an exhaustive list of superpowers, but it is a pretty big list. And I say you may suggest additional abilities, or you may include additional abilities at the GM's discretion. You know if. If you want a power that just says reality control, maybe that's a little bit too broad. But maybe it's not too broad because the superhero story that you're doing is like Rising Star, End of Rising Stars, or um, uh, The Authority or something, and you're like in the really, really high power zone. So I like, uh, I like Fastball Special. Your assist and setup actions both uh, provide both plus one D and either improved effect or position because fastball special, this kind of teamwork ability. Productive misunderstanding is the uh, two characters have ne that have never met each other fight the first time they meet because they misunderstand what's actually happening. Beautiful. And what that lets you do is may, uh, ask a gather information question and then gain bonus effect when you follow up on it. Now you can, when you intentionally or accidentally get into a fight with a hero, um, so you can l basically learn them by fighting them. I considered having this be a, when you fight a hero or when you observe a hero fighting another hero, I may go back and forth on that. Um, Master of the Mystic Arts is kind of my nod toward the fact that there is magic in superhero settings, in many superhero settings, and I wanted magic to feel a little bit like its own thing because it, magic is usually set apart from other superhero superpowers. And super science, I can kind of just do, it can kind of just be there anyway. Maybe I'll have a super science thing. Um, I do have armored costume and heavy armor. I do have a super science gadget as specialist gear down here. Uh, find incapacitating weapon. Cheesy banter is an intangible load item because 
I watched uh, Batman Super 66 uh, a lot as a small as a small human. So my supporting cast is filled with um, references. Lane, an intrepid reporter. JJ, a domineering boss. Uh, absolutely a rude no. Yes. Um, so we have, um, and then not all of these are like direct references. Wade, a complicated anti-hero. That's Deadpool. Um, D, a downtrodden hero. I don't remember. Some of these are, I intentionally did like several steps from the pop culture reference to be less overt. So I don't necessarily remember what this one is. And uh, the Weaver, a D-list villain, just because I wanted to have a D-list villain on this uh, on this thing. So we have a plucky sidekick, downtrodden hero, um, so on and so forth. A supporting cast is meant to be evocative. It doesn't have to be exhaustive. And then I have region advances. There's no I in team. This is the um, kind of the the critical teamwork move, but it. I also added, when you make a group action with at least two player characters, you may count your scale as one greater or one smaller. So a group of five heroes who have There's No I in Team could stealth through an enemy base as if there were only one or two of them. Or when they're holding off a horde of invading like alien bug creatures, a group of five could act as if they were a dozen people. So they fight as if they were a larger group. Yeah, I I did not spend that much time in Star Wars Galaxies, but I know a lot of people talk, like sing its praises because they were able to do that stuff of not having to be just a small set of characters. They didn't have to just play those archetypes. So I'm very glad that um, you got to be a, a grumpy scrap vendor on Tatooine or Rydnell. Summer event crossover is this thing that will let you use specialist abilities from other regions because superhero is more a setting genre then or, or there are many ways in which superhero is a setting genre more than a um narrative genre though it is both in different ways because the superhero genre emerges from the kind of pulp action uh, genre and then some from like detective stuff depending but then there's also other influences it's an interesting melange in a way that is sometimes at least in some cases distinct from other genres if we look at superheroes versus space opera the way that they um kind of the way that they draw and the way that creators use various um, intertextual works and combine different genres is different um this is this is me uh going back into my media scholar brain where i presented at an academic conference on um the many uh, genre, uh, basically the many genre of, uh, lives of Batman as a character, um, using the um, authority Batman crossover as a, a major text, because in that text we see a bunch of different versions of Batman. I I probably still have it somewhere. I wrote it like closer to twenty years ago than than ten. Um, but I'll see if I can, I can pull it up sometime. It might be something that's fun. We'd be fun to put on my Patreon, uh, with a caveat that like I wrote it a long time ago. Uh, and I would probably do it differently if I were writing it now. So yeah, uh, Heroes International, this will let you add to your supporting cast list. The only shrub for five miles. And then we have our breach advances. So breach advances, if you're not familiar are kind of these are GM um, special abilities that you can take when um, when the ripple in that region fills. And it, what it represents is that the story breach reaches such a level that the genre like kind of permanently shifts toward cynicism, nihilism, misanthropy. So epic fantasy w may shift toward grimdark. This is why we have Iron Age, which is the term commonly associated with the kind of deconstructionist era of superheroes. This is your Watchmen, your Dark Knight Returns, your um, Squadron Supreme, your like some of the like part the some of the arcs in Daredevil, like the um, Frank Miller Daredevil, something like that. Um, it would also be the Boys. Um, 
the the comic of the boys planetary is sort of that but also um because planetary has that but then is also doing for me the work of reconstruction um but that that's a longer conversation <laughs> Uh, planetary is a work that has meant a lot to me, which means that uh, it has been become very complicated, um, given things that folks have learned about uh, the writer, co-creator. Um, but that was made with other people, and those people, but uh, I have not heard things about to tell me that they are terrible, or have done terrible things. So, the Iron Age means that every time you use, try to use inspire, you're going to have reduced position or effect. And anytime you address a challenge with hope, collaboration, or compassion, you mark XP. This is a core element that I've added in Breach Advances. Breach Advances make the game harder when you are doing missions in that region, but they also give you more XP. And what that means is that the stakes on those missions are higher. You know going into the mission it's going to be harder. You're probably going to be spending more um, stress because you're going to have to push yourself more. You're going to have to use more of your resources. But you get an extra XP trigger, which is when you do something that direct, directly pushes back against the way that that breach advance has made the world shittier, then you're going to get a, um, a bonus. Yeah, and I think depending on later playtesting responses, I may... I may add something in the text about like there is a number of breach advances at which the uh, the team just fails, um, but I also want to leave some flexibility for people to say, oh, okay, we want to play hard mode, so we're going to say that when we begin our in our beat of four genre regions, there is a breach advance in each of them. You know, we're we're starting when the genres are really on their back feet. And we're having to push back against all this stuff, you know, especially if you have a group that wants to take on, that wants to look at the historical kind of shittiness trends in a variety of genres and fight them head on. Then maybe you want to use breach advances from the beginning. And then the last breach, uh, so I have uh, super cops because cops and crossover fatigue. All consequences from plot twists related to surprises or regarding new threats are one step worse. So if you had a controlled consequence and it was related to new threats, it would count as a risky consequence. Um, kind of the consequences escalate. One thing I, I love about Breach Advances is that I write a little bit of flavor for each of them. We were already facing a schism in the Heroic Guild, and now the Crime Consortium has summoned their multiversal doppelgangers to take over the world. And there's a zombie virus! So... Crossover fatigue is the term for um, readers uh, in, in the world in the comics world uh, being tired of um, basically line wide crossovers dominating the publishing schedule, where there have been time periods in Marvel and DC when a writer on a comic is really getting um, hijacked for most of their run by a crossover. Like, oh, you have to fit into this crossover. And then coming out of that crossover, you have to try to get back to whatever you were trying to do, but then you have to head back into another crossover. And then, um, so the, the, the text for Super Cop says, stand down, vigilante. We have to do things our way. We're the only ones that get to wield violence in the name of the state, or er, I, I mean justice. And all that kind of stuff. You know, I'm editorializing. And, like, if people don't like this stuff, that's fine. They're probably not going to be... There. Maybe they won't get as much out of the game as the people who are the ideal players. Um, and if you don't like what I say, if you don't like that text, you don't have to put it into play. And if you don't like breach advances, you don't have to have them in your game. I, and specifically, not because like of political objections, uh, I have a note in the text that says, hey, this is the design intent behind breach advances. Some of these breach advances speak directly or operate along the axis of historical oppressive trends within these genres. If you don't want to have to deal with that in your game, you can just ignore these. Like, 
specific, explicit invitation to ignore the elements of the game that are going to make it harder for you to play the game the way that you want to um, along that axis. Um, because people don't need my permission to do so, but I want to. I wanted the text to be specific in identifying the fact that I understood that this was a potentially fraught um, element and that I was not trying to suggest that people should have to uh, role play their own oppression or stuff like that. And as the kids are asleep says, where else would I editorialize except in my own game? You think this is polemic? You should see something else. I don't know. So that is that. What else? Um, so I did a play test of Genre Knots at Big Bad Con, which was, I guess, just over two weeks ago. And so I, I pitched the play test to Big Bad in the summer, I think, saying that I wanted to do this, and it was accepted. And there were three rounds of um, event signups for the convention where at the, like, the first round of signups, you could sign up for two games that kind of took a slot. There were other things that didn't take a slot. And Genre Knots, four seats, because I don't, I, if I can pr uh, avoid it, I don't like playing with five or more players. I find four a lot easier. Um, just to make to make sure that I feel like I'm including everybody in a, in a, to a degree that is more exciting. And it's just easier to kind of weave that many player characters together in terms of their stuff. I have run and I'm currently running a game for a table of five on Start Playing Games. I think that that is fine because I know that system super well and I know the setting really well. And I am like part of what I'm doing in Start Playing Games is I am setting myself a challenge of bringing my absolute best as a GM every single week for that game to push myself to get better. But for a play test where the players are going to be people I don't know, um, and it's going to be at a, you know, the first convention that I've attended since January of 2020, which is the case here, I set four. All four of those seats filled. It turned out to be two sets of two people. So it was like a group, you know, two friends and then two friends, which is great because everybody at the table knew at least, or all the players knew at least one other person. And that made it, I think, a little bit easier. So I was running the scenario that I used as the first mission for the Strange Friends playtest group, my kind of private first playtest group. Actually, I guess technically I ran, the very first playtest I ran was for a different home game group. And then I ran it for Strange Friends, but the Strange Friends private playtest is the one that's continued for 10 plus sessions. So I took that mission, which is the case file in the Epic Fantasy region, Advanced Perils and Perilisks. Um, and I ran the scenario for this group of people because I had ran, I'd run that scenario now four times. I think this was the fourth time. So for the Strange Friends, and then I ran it at a Magpie playtest in their discord and then um <laughs> i mean i think part of part of what i find fun about force in the dark games is that you can just um change the rules and push them in directions that you want and the game mostly holds up under it i think in a lot of cases um i think there are ways that you can play against design intent and undermine some of the other elements of the game but that is a broader conversation um so yeah i done strange friends magpie i ran a very short version for uh that was part of the um the break my game play test segment at the tabletop mentorship program, which is the thing that I did where I, I had the mentor that I was mentioning earlier. So I did that in, it was a 90 minute session. So it was a very abbreviated version of the mission. And then I ran it for this group at Big Bad Con. So it was the, only the second time I had run a TTRPG in person since the beginning of the pandemic. The first time was 
a, a one-off game of the only logical solution is hijinks for Meg and a couple of our friends who came down and um, visited, um, I guess, probably two months ago at this point. And like almost like my almost all of my gaming in except for that one time since March of 2020 had been online using virtual tabletops and things. So I was doing things like, um, here, look, I have I have um, I have index cards and I'm drawing uh, a clock on them so I can I, the fun of writing a thing and putting a clock in the center of the table in front of players is very cool. I think there is an impact there that is a bit different than when I just add a clock to an overlay um, or to a VTT um, screen. One More Multiverse does have a thing where you can have that text like kind of fade in and fade out on the screen when you add a clock or something like that. That I think is pretty effective. Yeah, I think, uh, like you said, Arudinal, um Munchkins, I think you can you can break the game with munchkinning because you like stack all the dice, but there's all like there are co resource costs which makes mitigates that a little bit. Um, but I think you can s sort of break the game if you can um, kind of convince or bully small b bully the GM into letting you roll your best action at better effect when you really maybe you shouldn't be able to um because the player gets to say what action they're going to use but then the gm gets to say the position and the effect and that's kind of supposed to be the balance for being able to pick whatever you want to be using um to to address a situation and then i think you can break the game if you change some of the things that are aspects of the kind of um score downtime flywheel where you do scores you gather you gain heat and rep and coin and then you can spend coin to reduce heat you can spend rep and coin to increase tier and then the heat that you get impacts what in uh, entanglements you get and those entanglements can impact coin rep or heat that flywheel i think you can impact in a different way by playing against or breaking the rules. And so that's just something else to have to be aware of. So the play test, I think, went well. I think I was, in fact, pretty nervous because it was, I think, the second full day of the con, and it was the first time I'd been around this many people in a like intentional social space in like since the start of the pandemic. Because I've all, I've gone to uh, virtual cons, and I have been kind of around the edges of physical cons. Like I I went down and had a lunch with my agent when Worldcon was in DC um, in I guess 2021. But this was, here's a, here, here is, we're in a uh, airport hotel, and while there is a giant atrium in the middle, which is like where the main social space is, and the COVID kind of um, protocols are very stringent and pr um, protect people, it was, I was just not super comfortable. It took me a couple of days to kind of settle in. And because it was a convention in a part, in a, a field, like in an industry that I'm not as established in, I go to a book convention in science fiction and fantasy. I'm, I'm already known more because I have a track record. I know a lot of people. And so that kind of, that kind of thing was just different. The feedback I got from that game was largely consistent with all of the other feedback that I've been getting. Going to this game and running it in person did not lead to like, uh, uh, qualitatively or quantitatively different feedback. Now that was for a four hour session. And a lot of what I'm looking for feedback on at this point is campaign scale stuff because I wanna know how well people feel that, the, that that flywheel that loop in genre knots works, especially with regards to here is your beat and here's the ripple in the different regions and how that feeds back into inst instability and leads to chaos. That kind of thing is a big thing that I want feedback on. And it's hard to model just on my own. 
because I want to see how it works in play. I can do like statistical models and I've kind of run those in a informal fashion because I don't actually have a lot of, I don't have like formal statistics training. I did not take a statistics class in college. If I could go back and talk to 18 year old Mike, that is probably one of the things I would encourage 18 year old Mike to do is to just take the most basic statistics class that I can in college um, and like audit it just to get the material and get practice with it to then be able to use it later in life. Um, I probably would have also taken classes in a few other like areas of interest outside of my um, majors, but I was doing a double major. And so a lot, I just had a lot of required stuff. Um, yeah. Ditto or Um Cause even like, even down to, okay, what is actually the chance that if you rolled five D tens, uh, none of them would be uh, a one. Like I, I couldn't, I couldn't give that to you instantly. Um, in the way that maybe I could if I had taken a statistics class. Uh, oh yeah, GIS, is that information studies? I don't know what GIS stands for. So that play, play, play test was affirming, it was not revelatory, I mean, that's fine. Um, geographic information systems. Interesting. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. The, um, there was a like physical geography class that I took as part of the semester at sea. And that's probably the closest that I got to what you're describing here. So having done this play test, the two next big things that I want to do, and I think that they are going to be one and then the other. I have, like, the last time I checked in with Kim May, we talked about genre knots and kind of where it is and w what I'm looking to do and the timeline I imagine for that. But the the thing that I am focused on right now for genre knots is adding more to the text so that it is ready to be formatted into a PDF that is more easily searchable and to share that with my playtest groups and to have that be the addition that I put up on itch.io as a, um, an in-progress game. So when you publish on itch.io, you can flag that something is in progress and that it will like, receive updates. There are a lot of people who do that on itch.io. This is kind of an equivalent to the early access system on Steam, where it is flagged that this is not a final version. People's expectations are not going to be that it's a final version, or at least they should be. Um, they, they should not be expecting a final version. But what I will be releasing is something that I want to be fully playable without someone having to know these other games, or at least without them having to have the text of those other games. Maybe, maybe it's fine if the game works best if someone already knows other games in the system, but that's like using the system, but that's kind of the case for any RPG w within a framework that is that has a bunch of different games using the same system. Um, it would be easier for me to pick up Apocalypse Keys because I have played other Power by the Apocalypse games. That's fine. Um, and I have the, the SRD from Blaze in the Dark, like this kind of chunk of this license that I'm allowed to use with this text. Um, but I want to fill out the rest of the game so that I'm not as much relying on kind of implicit kind of uh, implicit knowledge and skills on behalf of the players. Because one of the other things is I want this to be something where people can read the genre knots books and then see that there's an RPG and play the RPG even if they have not played many other RPGs. Because that would be really, really cool. And while I think that there is a notable crossover between people that would like and read genre knots and people that would like and play independent TTRPGs, um, there's no guarantee of that. And there's so many independent TTRPGs now. Somebody who is 25 could have started playing role-playing games in college, uh, playing like belonging outside of belonging RPGs that are diceless and GMless three years ago and spend a huge amount of time playing TTRPGs and have never heard of Blades in the Dark. 
and those people are role players, just the same that somebody who has played D&D for 20 years and never played anything else because why would they want to? This is a thing that sometimes we hear people talk about. Um, all of those people are people that play role-playing games. I would love for any of those people to feel comfortable picking up play, uh, you know, this kind of Forge in the Dark game. I said Blaze in the Dark because the text Blaze in the Dark from this logo is right there in front of my face. Pick up my Forge in the Dark genre's game and play it. So what that's going to entail is, like I said, adding more material, doing like probably a, a, a proof, probably more a, a proofread than a copy edit because this text is going to continue to change. I have access to some free art. I might put some of that free art into the publishing document when I'm using Adobe, or not Adobe, uh, Affinity Publisher, which is the kind of equivalent that I have to Adobe. And then prepare, like prepare and publish that PDF, put that PDF up on itch.io as this in progress game and kind of include in that material discussions of like, oh, okay, if you are going to do a play test of this, I would love to hear about it. Um, you know, please get in touch with me so that I can kind of, because I'd love to ask for feedback because I have that one group doing play test and my other efforts to help somebody get a play test group up and running have been um, have met with some difficulty because lots of people are very busy. The economic situation for a lot of people is very bad this year. And so people maybe are working more or they don't have as much leisure time or, you know, any number of other things because we're also still in a pandemic. Like it's not the greatest, it's not the best of times for a lot of people. And that's totally understandable. The thing that I want to do sometime around or not too long after this edition, depending on how quickly I get feedback, is I want to pitch the game. I'm going to go to, um, I certainly will, the kids are asleep. Yeah, when when I get that version up and publish it, and then I've confirmed that it looks good, I will be, um, I will be shouting it out on all of the channels, and I will for sure include the, uh, the St Strange French chats um, so that, that you can hear about it. Because I also want, like, you know, if Brandon wants to shout it out to people that, that he knows or that they've uh, kind of talked to it about, then, you know, I would want that as well. And then I'll be shouting it out on um, <laughs> Yellow John Epel or I will. Yeah, um, I think John John is going to get those updates because um, because John is following my Patreon. Um, but yeah, I will I will shout, uh, shout, shout, shout it all out um, and spread the word. Because, you know, if I can sell a hundred copies of the game at fifteen dollars $15 each, then that's a bunch of money I can put into layout, editing, or design or something. Um, will I sell that many copies right away? I don't know. It'd be pretty cool if I did, though. Um, I know that there are, there are a lot of people who are designing Forge in the Dark RPGs, and there are a lot of people who are playing them. There are a lot of choices then, but I think even with the large number of Forge in the Dark RPGs that are being developed, I don't know that anybody is doing that it, any, anything, anyone is making a game that is even fairly close to what genre knots is. Not even a lot close. Um, not that this is 100% unique because nothing is 100% unique, but I feel like I am onto something good because I believe in genre knots as a premise both in the, in the ways that I've expressed it in the fiction and as a game that creates the framework and tools for people to engage both in the like homage pastiche adventure exploration fashion that someone might um, want to do of like, oh, I love stories in this genre. And so I want to play stories in this genre, especially in a game where I can be self-aware about it and that's fun. But also as a way for people to um, explore how and why they tell stories, um, which is some uh, an element that I put in the text and I'm going to be using in my marketing because when trying to sell, sell a game, a lot of the advice that I've seen has been like, tell people what experience you are setting them up to have by playing this game. What emotional experience are you setting them up to have? Yeah, uh, I agree, and thank you, Arudnell. So that is that. 
you know, the, the pie in the sky um, option for, for pitching is Evil Hat Productions because Evil Hat published Blades in the Dark. They published Scum and Villainy. They, they published Band of Blades. They are very well established. They're very well known. They have had a lot of successes crowdfunding RPGs. They are going to be publishing Girl by Moonlight. They are thus far the marquee Forge in the Dark TTRPG publisher. But a lot of people have been pitching them a lot of games. And so it might be a great fit for Evil Hat, but I might still get a no because of reasons that have nothing to do with the quality of my game. And I'm understanding that I need to be prepared for that. And regardless of that, I'm going to do my very best to to pitch it and represent the game as best I can so that I can give the game the best shot. That it, um, that it can have in terms of consideration there. But ultimately, the decision will not be mine. Um, like If they offer, then the decision will, would be mine, but they have to say yes first. There are a few other publishers that I think are options. Yeah, like everything that you say, or now scheduling, human resources, overall budgets, any of that kind of stuff. Um, or, you know, they have enough, they, they want to, like they have enough Forge in the Dark games on their schedule already. Um, you know, and that's kind of scheduling, um, and they want to expand into X, Y, Z, Q. Who knows? That's, that's not for me to say. It's for them to say. Um, if I get a no, ideally I get some good feedback. That'd be great. Can't expect anything. There are other people that are publishing Force in the Dark RPGs. A lot of people self-publish them. So there are some folks I might be able to reach out to and, like, hire as freelancers. Like, hey, can you edit my game? Can you do the layout? Can you do X, Y, Z? And I know some people who, who do that. And then I know, and some of then some people that, uh, some of the people I know, know people that can do that. So like two, two degrees of separation. Um, and the group Storytale and Collective just kind of opened back up. Um, uh, that person's wrong. It doesn't matter. Um, Twitter, it happens. Um, Oh, that was the puppy dog. So the the dog had surgery, which is why he's in that crate right here. All right, it's not a crate. It's a a set of five standing plastic things that are all connected to each other. So yeah, um, there are other people that have published Force in the Dark games, so I can pitch to them. I got some suggestions of places to pitch from my mentor, and if you know, I get through. If I get a no from Evil Hat and then I pitch a few other places and they say no, I'll probably see if I can come up with another few names of people that are established enough that I would that I would be excited to work with them. Um, yeah, I, I would I would love for anybody that says no to give me suggestions of other people to talk to. Um, that would be great if possible, but again, I can't, um, I can't expect. And if the games world is like the book world, not many people look super favorably on reacting to a no with, can you do more work for me and tell me who to pitch to? Now, maybe it's different in, in the, in the TTRPG world, or maybe people in the, in the, the world, um, will give that kind of feedback unsolicited as a matter of course. That'd be great. Because this is my first larger entry into the TTRPG world, I'm trying to be modest in my expectations. I think a distinct possibility is that if I am really confident in the game, but it does not get an offer from anybody on this, you know, however many large list of publishers that I'm excited about, I might still self-publish it or try to self-publish it in a bigger way, that being trying to put out a a paperback or hard copy version. Yeah, don't ask for more labor from someone who just rejected you, um, as the kids are asleep said. Agreed. Because I kickstarted Genrenauts to take it um, into the kind of season collection that is now the kind of main version um, or the main way of getting all of these, these books, especially if you want them physically folks who are readers and supporters of mine came out and helped me make that Kickstarter happen. And I would like to think that, you know, eight or so years later, I have grown as a creator and kind of made more connections and connected with other communities so that if I wanted to 
kickstart or otherwise crowdfund on like backer kit or something indiegogo whatever kickstarter is not the only game in town they're just the biggest player right that i could put together a really good plan com- commission some art and like a maybe vertical slice of game like to use video game terms to be able to make a great presentation for genre knots for a crowdfunding thing and then see if there is enough support and demand within the broader TTRPG world and enough, you know, by the powers combined of the communities that I'm in and the community of people that like my work and other TTRPG people that might be interested in it, if that together is enough to make it happen. Maybe it is. I think there's a good chance that it is. It would be a lot of work. I know how much work it is to do a Kickstarter. So if I can find a good publisher and they can publish it, even if they want to do a Kickstarter and I still put in a ton of work on that Kickstarter, I'm not the one who has to do as much of the capital P publishing work. And I would prefer that if I can, especially in the games world where I don't know as many of the things about publishing. You know, doing uh, uh, doing a KDP paperback of a TTRPG book I don't think is going to be anywhere near as simple as... Uh, doing, you know, as publishing a 400-page, uh, fairly straightforward text layout um, novel, right? And there's a variety of other things that are tricky. So that's where I am. Having this game to work on has been really great this year because this year has been hard in ways that 2020 and 2021 were not. There's a plane going by. I don't know if you can hear it. Um, it may be a helicopter we get helicopters all the effing time over this neighborhood I think it's a lot of like um, uh, like network news uh, helicopters because we live close to a park and Baltimore is oh no the crime in Baltimore there's a lot of crime in Baltimore but it also gets overblown um, because mostly because uh, sensationalism is good for news business and all that kind of shit um so the helicopters, they annoy me. But working on Genre Rats has been great. Getting to run it and play test it and get feedback has been really fun. Getting external play tests up and running has been a big challenge, but also a learning experience. And my hope is that working on Genre Rats will just inspire me to do more in game design, whether that is do more stuff for Genre Rats or publish other games. I Before I thought to make a genre knots forge in the dark game i thought about making a shield and crocus forge in the dark game because when the blaze in the dark kickstarter happened i don't think i had gotten that far in making uh, genre knots and so shield and crocus was more fully formed and present in my mind i decided to pursue genre knots instead because i had a clearer vision of what the genre not specific design elements would look like versus something for blades in the dark where i felt like more of the work was just going to be about setting um making one specific setting instead of the one specific setting of dusk wall that is in the book and so that's why i did that thing um maybe i would want to make another forge in the dark rpg maybe i wouldn't um i think there's other things that i've done that might make sense using other systems whether that is an existing system that i can make my own version of like powered by the apocalypse or it is making my own system for something. The advantage of using a kind of licensable or, you know, creative commons system is that if it's out there and a lot of people use it, I know it mostly works. And if I can learn how it works, then I can adjust it rather than having to build something from scratch. Again, see my lack of statistics uh, skill. I'm like, okay, so we're gonna have a system based on D8s and you need to roll six or higher to get a success. And math-wise, I don't know what that is, but uh, yeah, it feels good. The D6 stuff, I have a, a better uh, understanding of at least some of the critical breakdowns of probabilities for D6s. Um, and the dice pools are smaller than something like uh, Vampire the Masquerade. Where it's like, okay, it's a D10, and then you succeed on a six or higher, but then if you get two tens, they count as three successes, and so that changes things and any of that kind of stuff. Uh, I've not gotten to play Vampire 5th Edition. I've watched some actual play, and I've watched an actual play of Hunter 5th Edition, which uses the same basics, 
basic rules, but I did play a lot of the older uh, World of Darkness games back um, when I was in high school and college. So that is that. Uh, it is about 3.15, which is around when I was thinking I would wrap up. Does anybody have uh, questions about genre not stuff while I am here? If not, then I am going to pull up another Twitch page and, there's, and see if there's someone we should raid. And I think the answer to that is no. And you may have briefly heard a blip of other noise from Twitch. So I'm going to say, if you did not see it, and this is at least as much for people who are watching later on on YouTube, and that's fine. Hello, everybody on YouTube. I am going to go to... Do, 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 do. I'm giving people a chance to ask questions, and I'm going to youtube.com slash where I can give you the link to part one of Speculate's fundraiser marathon from this last weekend, which was grand old time. Everybody who has been in chat was there, and for that I'm very grateful to them. Um, but if you are have been lurking, or if you are seeing this later on, and maybe you didn't hear about it. So uh, that is at, over at youtube.com slash Arvan Eleron, A-R-V-A-N-E-L-E-R-O-N. I will also put that into the chat because the other one, the other YouTube link is um, uh, does not include the word Arvan Eleron, and it's a fantasy word, so I want it. Uh, I want to be able to. Um, uh, I'm going to save that, and cool, we're closing it. So it does this, and then I'm going to chain. Nope, I'm going to expand this back over to here so that my overlay is uh, in the right place. Um, happy writing, kids are asleep. Uh, thanks for hanging out. Thank you to Arudinel for hanging out and chatting. Thanks to everybody else who has uh, been here, come and gone, or whatever, for and uh, lurking. Thank you again to Megany e. O'Keefe for following the channel. And I think I, I will, I'll try, I'm gonna try to do something on Friday. I haven't decided what it is. This week has been hard because taking care of Oreo and um, making sure he's okay has kind of, I've recalibrated my what do I expect to get done levels to basically zero um, so that we can focus on taking care of him. Um, so yeah, I will be doing something. There is Girl by Moonlight this Sunday uh, over at uh, twitch.tv slash Arvanelleron. So check that out as well. And that is going to be speculate again. So that's it for me today. Thanks, everybody. See you next time. Bye. Where's my end? Ending.